In the 1800s, West Virginia had over 500 water-powered mills. Today, there are only a handful of mills remaining. Located on the banks of the Little Kanawha River in Arlington, Fiddler's Mill is the last remaining water-powered mill in Upshur County. For over 100 years, the mill has been the center of commerce and activity for the region. Daniel Peck built a one-story mill on the site in 1821. William Fiddler bought the Peck Mill and Farm in 1841. He rebuilt the mill and opened it for business in 1849. William, and later his son William Martin, provided ground flour, meal, and feed to the residents of the Seven County area until 1901. In 1901, E.G. Wilson bought the mill and enlarged and modernized it by adding a dam and turbine motor. Hudson Fiddler purchased the mill in 1905 and added a sawmill, mortuary, and wool carting operation. The mill was a center of commerce for the area until a flood washed away the dam in 1942. The picture in the background shows the mill in about 1910, with the sawmill and the general store shown up river. In 1979, Fiddler's Mill was sold to the Grafton Coal Company. Grafton Coal originally planned to use the building as office space. But in 1980, after realizing the treasure that existed in the mill, Jim Compton, the owner of Grafton Coal, deeded the mill to the Southern Upshur County Business Association on the condition that the mill be restored. Suba formed the Friends of Fiddlers Mill Incorporated, which was given the responsibility of restoring the mill. Join with me now as we walk through the door into the past. The first floor of the mill was where the actual milling of flour was done using two mill wheels or French burrs. It was also the office for the miller and was also used to bag flour from the sifter on the second floor. Today, the first floor is also used as a museum containing artifacts from the period when the mill was in operation. We will take a more detailed look at each floor in a few minutes. As you look around the basement, you can see much of the mill's original stone foundation. The basement contains the turbine motor that drives all of the machinery in the mill. It also contains the equipment that was used for grinding corn into meal. The basement was also the carpenter shop where caskets were made for the mortuary. At one time, it also contained a cider mill and the storage area at the foot of the stairs was used for storing apples.
We are now on the second floor of Fiddler's Mill. The second floor served two purposes. It housed the two-stage sifter, where flour was sifted to a very fine consistency, and it contained the wool processing operation. Raw wool was brought in by the farmers, where it was mechanically picked and carded. Some of the carded wool was then taken to the general store and made into rugs and clothing on a barn loom. This loom is now stored on the second floor. We now return to the basement and start taking a more detailed look at each floor. One of the first things that you see at the foot of the steps in the basement is part of the elevator system that moved grain and flour to various parts of the mill. The elevators were basically small metal cups attached to cloth belts. We are looking at the main vertical shaft. The turbine motor no longer exists, but a new water wheel has been installed to take its place. Eventually, this shaft will be connected to the wheel. To the right of the turbine shaft is one of the two shafts leading to the mill stones. The lever that you see was part of the mechanism that would disconnect the stone from the power. What you are looking at is part of the system of elevators and chutes that move flour and grain throughout the building. This 1872 Eureka mill was used to sift and separate corn. The corn was ground using the millstones on the first floor. The ground corn was then sifted and sized for use as either feed for livestock or as cornmeal. This is the planing bench where wood for making caskets was planed and finished. At the end of the bench is a homemade belt driven belt sander. Here, you see the horizontal drive shaft that was used to power the saws and other equipment used in the casket shop and the corn mill. You can also see some of the other artifacts that have been donated to the mill, such as the old Singer sewing machine. Between the shaft and the table is the original Burnside stove that was the only source of heat for the mill. The stove was located on the first floor. A few of the other items located in the basement 
include a belt tensioner, a cooper's bench, some old chairs, and a few of the original mill windows. Back on the first floor you are looking at one of the two millstones or burrs. This one is in its cover with the feed hopper in place and is ready to be used. The second stone is disconnected from the power and uncovered so that the miller can balance or sharpen it. Because of the weight of the stone and the speed it turns, the stone had to be perfectly balanced. To balance the stone, the top is coated with a thick layer of plaster. The stone is slowly turned under a leveling rod. The plaster is chipped off the top where the wheel is out of balance. Here you are looking at the device that is used to lift the millstone so that it can be turned over for sharpening. The sharpening procedure consisted of chipping at grooves in the bottom of the stone using a hammer. Sharpening the stone could take two to three days. We have opened one of the elevators so that you can see the buckets attached to the cloth belts that move the flour and other grains around the mill. In the ceiling, you can see one of the swivel chutes that transferred oversized flour from the sifter on the second floor back to the millstone so that it can be reground. Here, you can see one of the bagging chutes.
the map that you're looking at is of Upshur County in the 1940s. In the 19th and early 20th century, wheat was harvested using a cradle scythe. As the stalks were cut, they would fall onto the cradle and were stacked. The stacked wheat was usually taken to the barn and run through a winnower. The winnower was basically a hand cranked fan that generated enough wind to separate the wheat from the chafe. The mill has been donated three winnowers of various styles and ages. Well, let us take a look at some of the other museum items that are located on the first floor. This is a hand cranked corn mill. Here is one of the sets of scales that was used to weigh flour and corn. On the scale platform are several wooden block planes. This was the original miller's desk that was built back in the 1840s. The cloth on the quilt rack is made from flour sacks. This desk was used when the original Miller's desk was moved to the Fiddler's home. On the desk is a 1940s vintage cream separator. This copper pot was used to make apple butter.
When the county commission decided that the mill's barber chair was a health risk, the chair was replaced by this piano stool. This well-used butcher block is from the Fiddler's Kitchen. As we walk up the steps to the second floor, you can see the horizontal drive shaft that provided the power to the flour sifter and the wool carding operation. At the top of the stairs is the two-stage flour sifter. Flour was moved from the millstone discharge in the basement by elevators to the second floor. There it was sifted through a fine mesh of Chinese silk. Depending on how fine a flour was needed, it was either bagged from the first stage or the second stage. Any flour that would not go through the silk was fed back to the millstone through a swivel chute. The Chinese silk eventually got to be too expensive and American silk was used in its place. A wool carding operation was added to the mill in the early 1900s. Prior to this time, wool was all carded by hand. The raw wool was sprinkled with lamp oil to keep out bugs and mice. It was then stored in this hopper.
The first part of the carding operation was to run the raw wool through the picker. The picker removed any burrs, twigs, etc., and it fluffed the wool. Shown here is the fluffed wool and a set of hand carders. The wool carder consisted of a series of very short bristled wire brushes. As the wool passes through the brushes, it is compacted and all of the fibers are turned in the same direction, thus forming a batting. Depending on how the wool is fed, the batting comes out in either flat sheets, which were used for stuffing quilts or clothing, or in cords called roving, which was spun into thread and used on a loom to make rugs or clothing. Fiddler's Mill is fortunate to have been donated a fully restored operational barn loom. This loom is used by mill volunteers to demonstrate how to make rag rugs. These are pieces of the original barn loom that was in the mill's general store. And finally, here you see an Appalachian great wheel that was used to spin roving into thread.